since September the 13th, Jesus has been on the move. I don't know if you're aware of that or not, but for the last few weeks, this is where we've been. We've been on the move with Jesus. It is good to see you. Thank you for being here this morning. I'm filling in for John Whitten. He's been out for most of the week with other ministers uh, on a little retreat up in Arkansas. He'll be back this evening. We look forward to his return. Uh, Goodness, thank you, Eric. Thank you for leading us. Thank you, Ensemble. Thank you, Orchestra. Uh, Thank you for those of you who are watching, streaming with us this morning, listening on the radio. You're worshiping with Pioneer Drive Baptist Church in Abilene. And it is good to see my friends here this morning. Great to see you. Uh, We'll do this four times this morning. In every service, the commonality is that Jesus meets us here, is that he's been waiting for us since the sun came up to come and to worship him and to be a part of this uh, celebration together. Jesus on the move, uh, healing, sowing, Jesus on the move, preaching, initiating, uh, Jesus on the move, uh, feasting, Jesus on the move today, multiplying. Were you a good multiplier when you were in grade school? Do you remember first or second grade, maybe third grade? You know, subtraction, addition, you got to get down the basics, and and then you can finally get to multiplying. Were were you a good multiplier whenever you were in school? Multiplying, expanding, growing. A man by the name of Truett Cathy in 1967 had this idea of running a little little cafe, a a little store where people could come and Maybe have breakfast, maybe have lunch. It was in Atlanta, Georgia. It was 1967. And he ventured out with that one little store. That one little store became, today, 2,624 of those little stores. Chick-fil-A. Do you know Chick-fil-A? Have you been to Chick-fil-A? Can I get an amen for Chick-fil-A? We love Chick-fil-A. We do. The one here on this side of town, always a ton of traffic. When we're in Arlington with our grandkids, their Chick-fil-A is right around the corner and no traffic. It's wonderful. We love, we love Chick-fil-A. But it all began with one store, one store. In 1980, Barbara and I were uh, leaders, sponsors for our our high school trip uh, from our high school choir in Fort Worth, Texas, our home church, South Hills Baptist Church. The Pars, they were a part of that. The Cooks, they were a part of that. Others were a part of that. And we were going from Fort Worth, Texas, down into the deep south, Mississippi, Georgia, Alabama. And they said, hey, all of our meals will be planned around Chick-fil-A. Well, we had never heard of Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A was not in in Texas at that time. And I asked Ronnie, I said, what do you mean, Steve, what do you mean? We're going to be eating all the time at Chick-fil-A. He said, yes, it's a Christian-based store. Truett Cathy owns that store, and every meal that we eat, all 40 of us, every meal that we eat will be free for 10 days. Wow. Immediately, I was uh, sold on Chick-fil-A. We love Chick-fil-A. But something about multiplying, expanding, growing, becoming more and bigger, Jesus says, hey, the gospel has got to grow. More people need to know of the good news of the gospel. Up to this point, Jesus had been doing this all by himself. The disciples had followed. The disciples had been in training. The disciples had been learning. They had been at Jesus' feet. But Jesus had been behind the steering wheel. And he had been the one directing and leading and driving. But now this is going to be a radical change. Now it's going to be Scoot over, take the wheel. Hey, disciples, now you get to drive. Now you get to be a part of this ministry. Now we really are all in it together. Kind of like what we do today. We find this to be our text this morning. I'm going to ask you to stand, if you would. Mark chapter 6, verses 6 through 12. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Calling the twelve to him, he sent them out two by two and gave them the authority over evil spirits. These were his instructions. 
Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belt. Wear sandals, but not an extra tunic. Wherever you enter a house, stay there until it is time to leave that town. And if any, any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. They went out and they preached that people should repent. May God bless the reading of his word and may God bless this morning what we hear. Whatever it is that God wants to say to you and to me this morning. Thank you and please be seated. This is a commission to serve. These few verses, these six or seven verses, is the Lord commissioning the disciples to say, hop in, the steering wheel is yours, you go and spend the next 2,000 years, even today, serving the Lord, making a difference for the Lord. The word commission, oftentimes used in military terminology, and I know I'm looking at some folks here who have served in the military, I'm wondering this morning, do we have any commissioned officers? That word commission, commissioned officers watching us this morning, worshiping with us this morning. That word commission is a great word. It's a word that says you've been appointed a certain task, a specific duty, a designated office. That word commission, you're either commissioned, you're commissioned by somebody and you're commissioned for something. In the military, you're commissioned by the President of the United States. In the military, you are commissioned for that specific job, that specific uh, assignment. Paul, writing to the church at Colossae, he shares with them uh, my commitment to the church, my commitment to the Lord. He says in Colossians 1.25, I have become its servant by the commission God gave to me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. Paul says, I've been commissioned. We've been commissioned. I'm looking at a, a room full of people, disciples, followers. We've been commissioned to serve our Lord, our God. We're reminded this morning that in this commissioning comes a calling. It's found in verse 7. In verse 7, Jesus says, Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over evil or impure uh, spirits. Jesus on the move, calling. Jesus has called you, and Jesus has called me. Graduated from high school in Fort Worth, going to TCU, uh, pursuing a business degree, uh, later going into the workforce Barbara and I both working for General Brick Sales in Fort Worth. In the process of doing that, hadn't started our family yet, and God calls. And God calls and says, uh, Jeff Reed, I want you to go into full-time ministry as, as a pastor, as a minister. I want you to leave this brick company, and I want you to follow me in this designated, commissioned, called profession. I want you to be a minister. Stop what you're doing and go to school. In fact, you're going to need a lot of schooling, Jeff. <laughs> go to school. With that calling, April the 1st, 1979, it's as fresh today as it was back then. But we continue to be called. Somewhere along this journey, God calls you. And you said, I believe in you. I accept you. I invite you into my heart, into my life. In the 1030 service last Sunday, uh, Sam Whitten came forward. John's seven-year-old boy came forward to say to his dad, I've been called. I've been called to be a disciple. I've been called to be a follower. You know, Jesus has called us past tense, but he's also calling us present tense. He's calling us today. And it may be this morning, watching, listening, observing this morning, it may be that God is calling you to be a disciple, to be a follower, to be a believer, to say yes to Jesus. 
that maybe this morning he's calling you into ministry, into service, into something really specific. Maybe something that, that you've been thinking about, you've been praying about, you're, you're kind of on the, on the, on the, you're kind of, and God is calling, God is speaking, God is, is whispering your name this morning. I think about this picture of our, our Pioneer Drive High School Choir. We are so blessed with the youth that we have in our church. Unbelievable. Eric, we appreciate the great job. We appreciate the history of what we have. We're reminded that, that there's a commissioning, there's a calling on the lives of these young kids, of these students, to come and rehearse and practice and practice and be a part of garage sale and, and make the trip and be a witness and, and be a follower of Christ. We're reminded that before they take off for Atlanta, before they leave for Pittsburgh, before they, they go to Charlotte, before they go to Boston, before they go to Corpus Christi, before they go, we commission them. We have a commissioning service right here. We circle the perimeter of this sanctuary. We invite prayer partners to come and to stand alongside. Oftentimes we will pin them with a gold cross or some kind of reminder that says, I'm praying for you. We're in this together. And you're being commissioned by our church. But more importantly, you're being commissioned by our Lord Jesus Christ to go and to be a witness. There's a calling that comes with the commission, but there's also a pairing. It's interesting that Jesus says in verse 7 that they will leave two by two. Jesus isn't making this up. There, there's a reason for that. It's well planned out. He's so far ahead of the disciples. He says, I want you to go in pairs. I want you to go in pairs because, because that's more powerful than just one is two. I want you to go in pairs because of the strong influence that you'll have. You'll be able to encourage one another and you'll be a valid witness for each other. What you see, what you see. What you hear, what you hear. What you don't see, what you don't hear. What you experience. Two's better than one because of the valid witness to each other, but also it multiplies the authority. Not just this person, but this person. And we go out together. It's rewarding. The importance of sharing that experience. The importance of the calling. The importance of being equipped. At the end of that verse, Jesus says, And I will give you authority over all evil spirits. Jesus is saying, Disciples, Pioneer Drive Baptist Church, he's saying to us, I give you special powers. I give you the authority of God to go and to share. Super power authority. April the 18th, 1938, he left Kryptonopolis to come to Farmersville, to Smallsville. He left Kryptonolopus to come from one planet to this planet. He came to Earth. He came with a birth name of Cal L, but his adopted name was Clark Kent. But we know him as Superman. Does that name sound familiar? All kinds, all kinds of superpowers, super strength, super speed. Super agility, super senses, super powers. Captain America, Wonder Woman, Thor, Spider-Man. They all came with such great powers. Jesus gives us those powers this morning. Gives us the ability uh, to drive out the evil, to make a difference. Because we go not in our own strength, but in the strength he has for us. You know, we've been around the block a time or two. We know this. We've experienced this. You could say, Jeff, let me tell you the story when this happened. Going in the strength of the Lord, the Lord working in your life and through your life, and you being able to say, wow, 
God was present. God did that. That was a God thing. To know that we are equipped. We are paired. We are together. And we are called. We are commissioned to serve. When you wake up in the morning, we'll go a hundred different places. We are commissioned to serve. When we leave in a few minutes and we go home, we go back into our neighborhoods. We are commissioned to serve. Wherever you're watching, wherever you're listening, you are commissioned to serve. And our Lord is wise enough. He is, he is smart enough to know that he's not going to commission you to serve and leave out the instructions. You ever, you ever bought something, maybe online or at the store or something, you got home, you were, you were looking for the instructions in the box, going to put this grill together, going to do this, going to do this, going to do this, and, and there's no instructions. Jesus says, hey, man, listen up. I have some instructions for you found in verses 8 and 9. Jesus says, these, these are his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra tunic. These are your instructions, Jesus says. Travel light. It's all about simplicity. Take a walking stick. I know I'm looking at some prime timers this morning who maybe use a walking stick. Maybe for balance, mobility, understandable. Some of you remember the name H.B. Terry. Some of you have tried to forget the name H.B. Terry. Just kidding. Hope Faye is watching from the Metroplex. H.B. used to always say, my walking stick, nope. And then he'd turn it like Zora. He'd say, nope, this is my poking stick. And he'd come up and poke you. And you had to watch out. Because HB was on the loose. And he says, take a walking stick. And your sandals. But you don't need this. And you don't need this. And you don't need this. You really don't need to burn yourself down. You need to travel light. Because Jesus is on the move. He wants us on the move. And he doesn't want us to be bogged down. He wants us to travel light. For years, I've spent a lot of time running and running and running. My good friend Dwayne Donaway sucked me into it, caught me at a weak moment. And years later, uh, we've run a lot. He's 38, he still runs. I'm 104, I've slowed down just a little bit. One of the things you find out in running world, in that culture, is that you want to run as light as you can. You don't want a big jacket. You don't want all of the clothing and the articles that come. You don't want all of this right here. You want to travel as light as you can. You want your shoes light. You want your shorts, your shirt, whatever you're wearing, you want it as light as you can be because we're going to go run 13 miles. We're going to go run for two hours. And you may feel great the first 15 minutes with all this stuff on, but when you get an hour into it, you're going to start shedding. You're going to start throwing stuff off. You can't do it. You've got to get as light as you can be. What Jesus is saying to these men and he's saying to us, is he wants us to be totally sold out, totally dependable upon God, upon him. We, we should always be having our eyes fixed on Jesus. You're going to run the race. You're going to be on the move. You're going to travel with Jesus. You're going to live in this world. You need to travel light. You need the simplicity. You need to know that provisions, God will provide all that we need. And there will be along the way some accommodations. That's another thought about instructions for service. In verse 10, we find that accommodations is really just a, a part of the, the culture of the, of the Hebrew culture, is, is having people come in. 
and stay with them. That was not unique. That was not something out of the norm. That was really a part of their culture. Whenever you enter a house, Jesus says, stay there until you leave the town. Accommodation. You know, that's the gift of hospitality. That's one of those spiritual gifts that Paul writes about is the gift of hospitality. So when we're on the move, when we're on the move, we know God's going to provide. Whatever it is, whatever it is, he's going to provide for you and for me. He will accommodate. But there may be some tough times. There may be some challenges along the way. I call it rejection because you're going to find some people along the way who won't listen listen to you. You'll find some people along the way who won't welcome you. You'll find some people along the way who will be indifferent to your words, to your witness, to your story, to your sharing. Like, I don't want to hear it. Disciples need to know this. Welcome to the real world, disciples. Welcome, welcome to Jesus' world. Not everyone's going to welcome you or listen to you. Rejection, men, is a reality. Charlie Brown and a friend are having conversation. conversation. And Charlie Brown says, you know, I learned a lot in school today. I signed up for guitar computer programming, stained glass, shoemaking, art, and natural food workshop. Friend says, how'd it go? Charlie Brown says, I've learned that what you sign up for in life and what you get in life are often two different things. Have you learned that? You have this expectation. You have this outcome. And the world throws you a curveball. And it ends up over here. It does. It ends up. And, and you take it personal. That sense of rejection. Maybe in a relationship. Maybe in family matters. If you take those concentric circles of the family and take them out far enough, we got some weird people in our families, don't we? We do. Maybe rejection in that area. Maybe something at work. Maybe you're expecting a yes and the answer came back no. That fulfillment is not there. Yet Jesus says, beware. Beware. Welcome to the world of Charlie Brown. Welcome to the world of the disciples. Welcome to the world of Jesus. Everyone, not everyone, will welcome you. And not everyone will listen to the good word that you have to share. The witness that you have to share. The kindness that you extend to them. Instructions for service, there they are. Provisions, accommodation, rejection. Commission to serve by God and for his kingdom. Each one of us for his kingdom. And lastly, this morning, the uh, challenge to for submission for service. We take a message with us when we leave. We take a message back into the world. We are radically different than the world. We're followers of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus on the move. A message of repentance. A message of forgiveness. Disciples, you're going to go out into the world. And the message is not your own opinion. The message is not what you think about. The message is the message of repentance. And yet since the beginning of the Old Testament, the New Testament, and today, that is the message. That is our message this morning. Noah's message from the steps going up to the ark was not something good is going to happen to you. Amos's Amos was not confronted by the high priest of Israel for proclaiming confession is possession. Jeremiah was not put into the pit for preaching, I'm okay, you're okay. Daniel was not put into the lion's den for telling people possibility thinking 
will move mountains. John the Baptist was not forced to preach in the wilderness and eventually beheaded because he preached, smile, God loves you. The two prophets of the tribulation will not be killed for preaching God is in heaven and all is right with the world. Instead, what was the message of all of these men was the one word, repent. Repent. Turn. Draw near to him. Say no to what the world proclaims. And say yes to what our Lord proclaims. A message of repentance. This morning I think about that repentance prayer. I think we have it, Dennis, on the screen. For our own hearts and for our own lives. Take, take a minute and read that. Take a second and read that. Lord, you know my heart. There's nothing I can hide from you. I have strayed from the path. I have been lured away. But, O oh, Heavenly Father, restore to me the joy of your salvation, that wonderful freedom and joy when I first came to know you. Do you remember that day? Do you remember that moment? Do you remember that place? Do you remember those people? Yeah. Do you remember being on fire? Do you remember being excited? Do you remember being ready? Do you remember being on go, a green light? Let's do it. Let's take the world by a storm. And then you found out this is a, is a marathon. It's a lifelong race. It's not a sprint. It's not a hundred yards. But we got to go the distance. On Tuesday, I'll preach a funeral over in Baird for a good friend of many of us, a lady by the name of Flossie Bradley. Don't you love that name? How good a name is that? Flossie. Lived and bared. Old school. Old, old school. Sweet lady. Long time, 35-year member of Pioneer Drive Baptist Church. Many people that need to hear the good news that lived in her heart. That lived in her heart. Every time I saw her, every time I visited her, visited her in Baird. Visited her at Hendrick Medical Center. See her in the hallways back here. Always a good word for the Lord. A good word for the Lord. A good word for the Lord. You can see the joy of her salvation with her eyes her smile, her countenance, her personality, her life. That's who we need to be. That's who you are each and every day. But Lord, it begins with repentance. It begins by turning to you. And maybe today you've never made that decision. Maybe today you've never heard this type of preaching. Maybe you don't know the good news of the gospel, but today you know that Jesus loves you. And you can make that turn. Or maybe you have gone a different way and to a distant land, a, a different direction. And maybe this morning that might be your prayer. It's the prayer of repentance. And say, Lord, draw, draw near to me as I draw near to you that we could reestablish that joy of our salvation, that joy of our witness. Up to this point in this passage, Jesus has been behind the wheel. Now it's time for the disciples to roll up their sleeves and lead out to go, to be the hands and feet he invites us this morning to do the exact same thing, to be the hands and feet of Jesus each and every day. Our lives should look radically different from the lives of the world. We live in step with him and for him every day. 
So Jesus is on the move. On the move. Multiplying. Sending out. Calling. Equipping. Leading us as a church. He says to the Jeff Reeds of the world, and he says to you, come join me. Be a part of kingdom work every day. Be a part of kingdom work wherever God leads us. May we be found faithful. May we be found faithful and committed to him as he's committed to us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our studies of recent days, recent weeks, to be mindful, Heavenly Father, of your calling, your passion, your mission, bringing the good news of the gospel to a lost people. Inviting us to be a part of your team, a part of your family. Letting us experience the joy of sharing, the joy of living out the good news. Knowing, Heavenly Father, that that you could do all of this without us. But you share the joy. You, You share the rewards. You share the blessing that we get to come alongside and be on mission with you. Lord, we're, we're grateful today for the challenge this morning to renew our commitment to you, our fellowship of you, and our love for you. Speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Mm-hmm.